Hi friends, it's Deanna Williston with Our Blooming Catholic Life, and I'm back today with the chaplet for priests that I got from the Te Deum Foundation. I just did a video on this the other day, and it was brought to my attention that this crucifix is called the Pardon Crucifix. When I made the video, I knew that it was called the Pardon Crucifix, and that's about all I knew. And I was trying to read from you what the different symbols and things were. But of course, I went ahead and looked it up um, because somebody just kept saying about it, and I was super curious. So what is a Pardon Crucifix? Let me hold it up here for you. Um, and as of today, this has actually been touched now to the relics of St. Pius X and of St. Vincent de Paul. They were at my parish for the Feast of All Saints and Feast of All Souls. And so I asked permission if I could touch this to the relics. There was a third relic as well. I'm not 100% sure what it is. Um, but the, the most pertinent one here was St. Pius X. And I will say when I realized there was a connection, literally fell to my knees. I'm not lying. So if I was doing a... Uh, <laughs> reaction video. You would have seen me disappear off camera. So I'm kind of glad. I thought I'd look over the material I had printed out on the pardon crucifix. I was going to um, highlight out the pertinent bit and then make a video for you. And I got that far reading about St. Pius X and I was just so shocked. So one of the things that was pointed out to me was St. Pius X was actually a secular Franciscan like I am. So there's a connection right there um, as well as he is the one who attached the indulgences to it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. I just want to say this now. So the pardon crucifix, this is according to catholic365.com. I'm going to put all my sources in the description below. Next to the title, you tap the more button or a downward facing carrot, whatever's there, um, you can get more information. So this says the pardon crucifix has rich indulgences attached to it from Pope Pius X. His Holiness issued two statements regarding the pardon crucifix. The first, his pontifical rescript of June 1905, and the second was a pontifical rescript dated November 14th, 1905. The first prescribes the conditions for indulgences to be gained, and the second denotes the indulgences can also be applied to souls in purgatory. It was introduced with great support from Cardinal Pierre Hector Coulier, um, 1829 to 1912, the Archbishop of Lyon in 1904 during the Marian Congress of Rome. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. We're going to come back to the indulgences. But I was just really moved by the connections that I did not know were there. I thought um, I had the opportunity to touch something to the relics. And I thought this is for priests. This is where I need the power, you know, and, and, and the two saints that I knew were there. I was just blown away with the opportunity. And then to find out, you know, that, that Pope Myers the dead was actually a secular Franciscan as well as that he was actually involved with this crucifix really are making it very special to me. And so I'm going to put that, uh, you know, I'm not going to put it away, but I'm probably going to keep it in my hand. I don't really want to set it down. Whew. Okay. So catholic365.com. And this is an article from the well, I don't know what nomenclature they're using, English or, um, sorry, American or the rest of the world. So it was either on the 5th of March in 2020 or the 3rd of May in 2020. I don't know which system they were using. It says, although few Catholics have ever heard of the pardon crucifix, it certainly does not diminish the power it wields over Satan and his evil ones. In fact, it holds just as much power against evil as the miraculous medal and the St. Benedict medal. So let's, whoo. Look at this. Um, over here, oh, this is from the Roman Catholic Man.com, and it's going to talk more about the indulgences. So that's what I got more about the indulgences. And it, it confirms something, a slightly different fact. That's why I wanted to bring this up. This says that Pope St. Pius X declared indulgences on this crucifix in 1905, and it was approved in the Pardon of the Living and the Souls in Purgatory in 1907. This article has a few, just a tiny paragraph here suddenly, no longer mentioned in the New Enchiridion. And so I'm going to cover that first because some people are probably freaking out already. Um, so let's see, where are they? 
Oops, I think I'm on the wrong page. Hold on, let me go back to the one before. Yipes. Aha. This one is on a website called thelastcrusade.net. And the article is called The Pardon Crucifix, Graces and Misconceptions. I do not see a date on this. This is saying that most sites online present a deluge of misleading claims about the sacramental. So I just want to address this concern right off the bat. The Pardon Crucifix is an incredibly powerful spiritual tool. He says, I personally keep it on me at all times, but a common misconception is about the indulgences. So we're going to get on to what those five indulgences were later. Everybody agrees that there were five. But the problem is that Pope Paul VI cleared out a whole bunch of indulgences in the 60s. And it does appear that this, the ones attached specifically to the pardon crucifix, according to Pope Paul VI, may have been cut out. But there are still some attached to a crucifix or um, other object of devotion. So I want to cover those. This is supposedly in the current, whatever that word was. Ah, here we go. The Apostolic Penitentiaries and Chiridon of Indulgences. So there's two that may apply. This one, number one, says the faithful who devoutly use an article of devotion, crucifix or cross, rosary, scapular or medal, properly blessed by any priest, obtain a partial indulgence. Does it tell us what the proper blessing is or how to get it? No. But two is to the faithful in danger of death who cannot be assisted by a priest to bring them the sacraments and impart the apostolic blessing with its attendant plenary indulgence, according to Canon 468, number two of the Code of Canon Law, Holy Mother Church nevertheless grants a plenary indulgence to be acquired at the point of death, provided they are properly disposed and have been in the habit of reciting some prayers during their lifetime. To use a crucifix or cross in connection with the acquisition of this plenary indulgence is a laudable practice. That's really vague too, because it says you're not going to have a priest to bring you the sacraments and get the apostolic blessing, but you're somehow going to be properly disposed. So you're not going to have confession. I don't know how this one works. That one's a bit confusing. Again, I'm going to put all the links to these articles uh, below. And then there's quite a discussion that goes on in the in the uh, comment section of that. I want to describe the crucifix, and then we're going to go on and t talk about the historic indulgences. We're not going to discuss whether they still apply or not. Whether the technicality of the indulgences still exist I still think there's going to be a lot of graces attached to this and I'm going to continue on with them. I, I don't see why not. Um, okay. So what I wanted to say, let's see here. Jump ahead, jump ahead, jump ahead, jump ahead. Okay. The description, I wanted to go into the description that they had on catholic365.com because it's a lovely description of what's going on on the cross. I remember I couldn't quite make everything out on mine when I first got it. Um, and now I'm seeing it with their description. So ooh, here we go. You look at that and I'll read it. It says the front takes us back to Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. It portrays Jesus on the cross with a sign hung above his head reading Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which is from Matthew 27, 37. On the back, you can see the sacred heart of Jesus in the, sorry. On the back, you can see the sacred heart of Jesus here in the very middle of it. On the cross beam, so going across this way, it says the words of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them. It is one of the seven phrases Jesus said as he hung dying on the cross. And you can find that in Luke 23, 34. Um, then there's also these messages here. Sorry, these pages are pretty messed up. The vertical beam, the one going up and down, is the second phrase of the crucifix. These words take the individual back to an encounter St. Margaret Mary had with our Lord in 1675 when he spoke to her. Behold this heart which has so loved men. They are the words that Jesus spoke to the French nun and mystic, resulting in her promoting and spreading devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. 
on the bottom of the vertical beam. This was the part that I could kind of see but couldn't make out what it was. You see, there's a star above that nail and then there's a symbol. Can you make that out? I didn't even notice the symbol before because there's so much filigree on the front. I had not even recognized that until it was pointed out in this article. That's why I wanted to read this to you. At the bottom of the vertical beam serving as the anchor is a depiction of the Blessed Mother. It's the symbol of Our Lady with a star overhead that sits at the foot of the cross. The one who tramples the head of the servant and was pure from conception to her assumption stands at the foot of the crucifix. A combination of the forgiveness of Jesus, his sacred heart, the sacrifice at Golgotha, forgiveness for the world's sin, and the Blessed Mother at the foot. It's no wonder the devil trembles and wants people to forget about the pardon crucifix. Excuse me for just a second. <clears throat> okay. So what were the five historical indulgences contributed? This is listed pretty much in all the articles I could find. Um, whether they said they were continuing indulgences or not, is some did, some didn't. And I'm going to link them again in the description so you can look them all up. I'm going to go back to the one from the Roman Catholic man because it's nice and clear. So these were the indulgences. Whoever carries on his person the pardon crucifix may therefore gain an indulgence. So just for carrying it. Um, and I do think this is still a lovely devotion. And some people, like if children put a rosary around their neck, they freak out because that's irreverent or whatever. But for a child, it's actually very reverent. You know, you have to come to the heart of it at some point. And there is the story, and I can't remember the name of the king, but there's a story about a king. Um... I want to say it was in medieval, medieval times and he carried very openly a nice big rosary on him and he never prayed the rosary, but he always carried it everywhere and very openly, right? And, you know, our lady came to him in a vision one night and had some scales and was kind of giving him an estimate of what was going to happen here and piled all of his sins on one side of the scale and it went down. <coughs> And then in this, this side of the scale, she put all those people who were inspired to pray the rosary by him wearing it. <coughs> this happens every time I try and film this. <coughs> Sorry about that, friends. This literally happens every time I try and do a video about the Day Dam Foundation and the Pardon Crucifix. It's really weird. I don't think I've coughed at all today. <coughs> I have a cough drop. I'm going to try. Uh, you understand Mother Angelica a little bit more if you really try and do these videos sometimes. Okay. <sighs> Let's try and say the traditional indulgences involved with the pardon crucifix. Hmm. So one was whoever carried on his person the pardon crucifix may therefore gain an indulgence. <clears throat> it's very pocket sized. Um, if you have it on this little chaplet for priests that I got from the Te Deum Foundation, I'm loving praying it. The case keeps it safe. And this still fits in my pocket. The tiny pockets in women's denim skirts, this still fits in. And if not, it's easy to slip into a bag I'm carrying. It doesn't count as carrying a person, but it's easy to carry around so that you're ready to pray with. Secondly, the second thing you can do, devoutly kissing the crucifix, an indulgence is gained. Um, that is a common practice. I know if you're a Protestant watching this, you are probably horrified. I don't understand, personally, why <clears throat> Protestants think it's okay to have a cross around their neck, in the front of their churches, and they talk about how they're saved by the cross. You're not saved by the cross. You're saved by the death of Jesus on the cross. Let's not sterilize it. Let's know what this is. This is our broken Lord. The image of our broken Lord destroyed for us. Do I think it's him? No, but I devoutly kiss this image of the Lord in remembrance of him. That's not the same as worshiping the, the corpus that's on the cross. I don't think this little corpus is going to come off and do anything magical for me. I do it symbolically 
as if I was there at the cross. And that is the reverently for devoutly kissing the crucifix, <clears throat> imagining yourself at the foot of that cross. Remember how that description we had from Catholic 365 talked about it takes us to Golgotha. We're there. We're there in that moment, this image. And that's why having a corpus on a cross is so important that it remembers Remember that it takes you there. It's not just a wooden beam holding something up. It is the wooden beam holding up the crucified, the sacrificed body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So number three, whoever says one of the following invocations before this crucifix, just one of these has to be said. Our Father who art in heaven, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or I beg the Virgin Sorry, I beg the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray to the Lord, our God, for me. Let me say that again. There's two there. Our Father who art in heaven, forgive us our trespasses <coughs> as we forgive those who trespass against us. Or <coughs> I beg the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray to the Lord, our God, for me. What is number four? Woo, we're, get, we're getting a little more complicated as we go along, right? For whoever habitually devout to this crucifix will fulfill the necessary conditions of confession and Holy Communion may gain a plenary indulgence on the following feasts. The Feast of the Five Wounds of Our Lord, the Invention of the Holy Cross, the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, the Immaculate Conception, or the Seven Sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do even all of those feasts exist in the current calendar? I'm not sure. I'll have to look those up. We'll try and put that in the description below again. And number five is whoever at the moment of death <clears throat> fortified with the sacraments of the church or contrite of heart in the suppression of being unable to receive them will kiss this crucifix and ask the pardon of God for his sins and pardon his neighbor will gain a plenary indulgence. Wait a second. That makes way more sense. Number five. Let's go back. Remember we had that. <laughs> Um, the number two in the current one that said to the faithful in danger of death who can <clears throat> be assisted by a priest to bring them the sacraments and impart the apostolic blessing with its attendant plenary indulgence. Holy Mother Church nevertheless grants a plenary indulgence to be acquired at the point of death provided they are properly disposed. And remember, I couldn't figure out what that properly disposed means. And to use a cross or crucifix in connection with the acquisition of this plenary indulgence is a laudable a praiseworthy practice. So number five of the historical indulgence given by Pope St. Pius X was whoever at the moment of death fortified with the sacraments of the church <coughs> or contrite of heart in the supposition of being unable to receive them <coughs> will kiss this crucifix and ask pardon of God for his sins and pardon his neighbor will gain a plenary indulgence. It's so beautiful. So if you're unable to receive the sacraments, you need to be contrite of heart, especially um, because you're unable to receive them because some of those circumstances may be choices that you made along the way. So you need to be contrite. Um, and we'll kiss this crucifix. <coughs> That's the part of God for your own sins and pardon your neighbor. We'll gain a plenary indulgence. <coughs> May God bless you and keep you. May his make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. And may the Lord bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, friends. <laughs> Thank you for being patient. These videos have been so hard to make. Um, and yet I feel that they're so important. I feel like the more, <laughs> the harder they are to make, the harder I'm going to keep trying to bring you. I think that's showing me that this is good content and that's going to be a blessing in your life. Um, I'm very happy with this. I'm, I'm loving being able to pray it. You can say it so quickly. I just hope it's bringing fruit to the priests and the, the seminarians. Especially on this day when I'm filming this, this is all souls. And so it really reminds you to pray for priests because a lot of them, you know, they didn't get married. They didn't have kids. Okay, ordinary at priests <laughs> have that option, but... They don't have children, grandchildren. Some of them have nieces and nephews. Some of them don't. You know, people tend to forget you, to forget to pray for the dead. And it's such a laudable practice that we all need to be doing. And so re please remember when you include the dead in your prayers to include all the priests who have touched you throughout your life. The one who baptized you. 
the one who served you your first Holy Eucharist, you know, the priest who received your first confession, who was the bishop who confirmed you? Do you include him in your prayers? What about the, the priest who married you? Like, you have to include them all in your prayers. Or the one that took time when you were little to sit down and just color a page with you during bingo. I'm just saying you have to remember all the priests that have really touched your life in a positive way. Those who have been a spiritual father to you, a spiritual brother. Again, may God bless you. <laughs>